Good morning, everybody. This is Ed Avis. I'm the Managing Director of APDSP, and I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar today on reinventing repro post-COVID. It's a, a hot topic, and I think that uh, this, the, the COVID situation has given the repro graphics industry, like every industry, an opportunity to see what's going on and take some time to take inventory and predict what's going, going to happen in the future. It's a time to reinvent. <clears throat> um, we are very fortunate today to have three panelists uh, coming at this topic from different perspectives. Dirk Holscher uh, is the former editor of Larry Hunt Newsletters and uh, someone who is, has deep, deep knowledge in the imaging field. He also uh, has been an owner of many print businesses, including uh, a, a large number of them in Eastern Europe. And if you'd like to learn more about Larry, uh, pardon me, about Dirk, you can read uh, an article that we wrote about him on the website uh, a couple of years ago. He's had a fascinating history and he is still involved in this industry and is still considered a, a very insightful person on this, on this topic. Then we have Paula Fargo, <clears throat> the owner of Curry Printing in Baltimore. Uh, Paula is someone who uh, knows Dirk well, and I came to know her when she was writing for the Larry Hunt newsletters. Uh, she always wrote very insightful articles about uh, key issues in the imaging field. And uh, she is someone who I think uh, has a perspective that will help us, uh, help us grasp the future. And our third panelist is Paul Corman, co-owner of Truckman's Reprographics. Uh, Paul has been involved in Reprographics for decades. And when I was uh, asking some of my colleagues in the industry, who should we put on this panel? Paul's name rose to the top. Uh, so I, I, I talked to him and uh, learned more about him and uh, Truckman's. And Truckman's is a leading firm with a lot of innovations and a long history of innovation. Uh, so we'll be very interested to hear what Paul has to say. So the way uh, this uh, webinar is going to work is I have uh, some questions for the panelists that uh, will attempt to kind of draw out this concept of reinventing repro post COVID. Each of them will answer these questions and then we will open it up to questions to attendees. Uh, attendees, you can see that on your panel, on your screen, there is a Q and A tab uh, and you can ask questions there. Please do ask questions whenever they come to mind. Don't wait until the end, uh, and we will reply to them as appropriate uh, whenever we have a, a moment to do that. So don't wait until the end. Just fire off your questions whenever you're ready. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna uh, direct the first question uh, to Dirk. Dirk, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay. Dirk, uh, COVID has affected every business, mostly negatively. But did you find any silver lining to the crisis? For example, did you hear about any new types of work that emerged during this crisis? Uh, Ed, yes, there have been a few silver linings uh, that I've, I've heard about. Uh, one comes to mind, um, uh, a... Um, printing company, or a quick copy company, basically, it was approached by one and then two huge school districts to do at-home course packets for their students. Um, many students, and these are both fairly rural areas, did not have high-speed internet, or if they did, uh, mom and or dad were using it for work. And we're, we're, they had very low participation in their coursework, so they decided to go, to old, go back to good old paper. And so he's running two ships, <laughs> doing thousands and thousands of course packets and fulfilling them, either by messenger or by, uh, for a while they were taking them out in school buses, that didn't work so well. So now the US, USPS is doing it. Uh, and another obvious one has been the signage that's been required. 
For example, some of the big, uh, big box stores are now having one-way streets on their aisles. They have stickers, and I know companies that are doing those, uh, to put on the floor. Uh, that used to be used purely at trade shows, and that's a new application. Um, same thing with um, other signage required, uh, wear your mask, uh, you know, uh, uh, new hours, senior hours. So yes, there have been some opportunities. Okay, thank you, Dirk. Paula, let me uh, direct that question to you. Uh, at Curry Printing, have you found some silver lining uh, in this crisis? There's been a few silver linings, very few of them related to sales. We're selling whatever anyone wants to buy. We're doing the, the floor decals and the special signage and we're doing custom masks and custom hand sanitizers. I mean, all, you know, we're, we're, we're jumping on with, with all of those items, obviously, um, but they, they're certainly not of a volume to replace the business that has gone away as far as the events go. Our business was very heavily event oriented and um, without those events, you know, our sales have, have definitely taken a hit. But we're, you know, we're selling what anyone wants to buy. And, um, and so I, I wouldn't say the, the silver lining was in the, the sales of new items. I'll say that the silver lining was in the chance to um, to really see how your management of your company um, is doing. What's that old saying? When the tide comes out, you can see who's been swimming naked. Um, there's really no place to hide during something like this. And any management practices that aren't up to snuff are going to be smoked out immediately. And, um, and it's a good time to take stock, um, kind of get your, your team on the same page and tackle projects that might not get done when you're moving in sixth gear, but when you're in first and second gear, you've got a little time to, you know, to take care of some of those projects. So I would say those are mostly the, the silver linings. Great, thank you, Paul. Paul, how about you? At Truckman's, uh, any interesting new stuff going on or new opportunities not related to sales, as Paula mentioned? Yeah, well, you know, first, in terms of the effect of the uh, on the business, we uh, initially, uh, well, really immediately, uh, saw a significant dropout because just like Paula, we're, we're very event centric. So we do everything from invitations to events. I've got several portals that. Uh, that, that drop out daily invitations to events and uh, and you know we probably lost uh, twenty five thousand dollars a month in business uh, on those portals in a day um, at the same time we we in March had probably in the course of about three days we had seventy five thousand dollars worth of event graphics and, and all the materials canceled uh, spontaneously so it went down in a hurry uh, once once we started bringing people back we started uh, using a bunch of our people for pure research and promotion uh, to try to find as many opportunities as we possibly could. A number, number of years ago, I remember Doug Hook doing a presentation for IRGA uh, where he talked about going outside of the conventional circles of business to, to then use that to, uh, to gain access to businesses um, that you don't do business with, uh, as well as supporting your existing businesses with us. Well, we had no idea. One of the things that we, we picked up on early was the, the sneeze guards. Uh, we, had the, we have a flat bed, and uh, so we print on acrylic. So, uh, so we had it available, and people started asking us about it. Uh, then we started to promote it, uh, and we probably uh, done, uh, I don't know, maybe seventy-five dollars or $80,000 in sneeze guards uh, already. Uh, might be higher than that, and uh, I, I, we've got about uh, another eighty dollars to $100,000 in the pipeline. Um, and we're continuing to market it regularly. We have a, a list of about 9,000 um, contacts that we send information out to regularly uh, on that. And that's resulted in a lot of the floor graphics because we do do floor graphics and signage and pop-up banners and the like. So uh, it has up, opened up new opportunities. And one of the companies I did sneeze guards for, you know, we're a commercial reaper graphic firm. I'm a, I'm a reformed ammonia sniffer, an old blueprinter. 
Um, and I actually uh, sold uh, sneeze guards to an engineering firm I'd never done business with. And I was dealing directly with and walking through the empty facility with the president of the company. Uh, and we sold to all five of their locations. And now as they open, uh, we anticipate having opportunities for new business there. Uh, we're off a significant degree, but we've had open doors because we've sold to people something that nobody else could sell. Uh, and now that we're in relationship with them, I believe that'll that'll ultimately result in us having opportunities for for whatever the the new conventional business is, whatever whatever model that is. Uh, we are also doing a lot of uh, online order. A lot of a lot of clients are ordering uh, online, and we're doing a lot of porch drops, a lot of direct distribution, because their in-house office services are not open. Has not made up the difference, but you know it, it's I think part of what we're going to be looking at for a long time now. Thank you, Paul. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you got your foot in the door with an engineering firm that you had not worked with before. Who, who are some other clients who are buying sneeze guards that you had not worked with before? Oh, let's see. So we're doing a lot of, we, we've always done a lot of litigation, copying and scanning, but you know, early on the lawyers jumped on this sneeze guard thing and they're, they've spent more money on it than anybody. <laughs> it's a little eerie because uh, you know, it's like they're protecting themselves against what it is that they're, planning to do to the rest of us um you know the, the the issue is you know you do need to protect yourselves against the uh, against litigation you have to keep a facility clean and safe and and so they are going more overboard than anybody so the the, le the legal business has expanded even though we did work with a lot of them we're doing work with a whole bunch more that, that we'll have opportunities with uh we we're also doing work for accounting firms we've done work for coffee shops who by the way market so there'll be opportunities for digital print later on where we've done ice cream shops we've done um software companies uh we we have done uh institutions we did it we, we did about a fifty five hundred dollar job for a local township we did the whole municipal building the library all of the concession stands at the uh, at the pool and at the fields uh we we also have done uh, work for uh, well right now the schools are are you know contemplating coming back and we're we're quoting a lot of school jobs we've gotten a couple of them um, and so you know that's an area we see emerging as well uh, it has opened up uh, areas of business that we that really were not normal verticals of ours but you know now that we're in them uh, virtually all of them have other opportunities and so uh, we you know we're excited about uh, now that we've gotten to know people there and, you know, hopefully where we've done a good job with this, uh, uh, we, we, you know, I always ask people, you know, to give us an opportunity and, uh, uh, you know, with any opportunity, we'll have whatever share their business that we earn. Uh, we're in the door places that we've never been before in areas that are all new to us. That, that's a partial list. I'm sure there are more, uh, but uh, those are the ones that I can think of off the top of my head. That's great. Thank you, Paul. Now, Paul, you mentioned uh, that you're, using a flatbed for this work, but I assume you're also using a cutter, right? Can, can you briefly uh, explain the process here? Well, yeah, we don't, we're not printing any of this stuff. So basically it's, uh, it, 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 we, we go and you know, we're like carpenters now, we go out and measure um, and you know, determine what, it, what the need is. Sometimes it's just a straight sheet and we have, uh, have somebody who's fa fabricating aluminum bases and they're all different types of sources uh, for clamps and clips and hanging hardware. And so uh, you know, we, we've pretty much latched on to and done a lot of research on all of those kinds of things. We also are part of a consortium where other people are doing it. So we've gained a lot of knowledge from partners that we have through that consortium are doing the same thing. Uh, we've taken advantage of swapping services for things that we don't do in those areas as well that we're, we're outsourcing. But as far as the cutting is concerned, you know, basically we determine what has to be cut, if the windows that have to be cut into it, uh, if there are notches to go around uh, certain things on the top of cubicles, we're creating acrylic stands for simple countertops. We're creating, a, uh, essentially we, we have adapters to go onto the top of cubicles uh, that slot into the bottom of cubicle toppers, basically so that extend the tops of cubicles. Um, and uh, rounding corners, you know, we're, we're ba at this point, we're, we're doing installation as well. We've used some of our resources for people who didn't ha have, they didn't have as much work in their regular jobs, but they're, ha they're handy folks. Uh, and so we've actually, had, we've actually had two installation teams go out as well. So it's kind of like carpenters, you know, where we're going out and we're, we're measuring jobs, we're doing estimates and 
the, the, the thing is that we're probably getting between 80 and 90% of the jobs because, you know, nobody was doing this before. And the other thing is that there's a shortage of acrylics. So, you know, we got in this early and through our consortium partners, we're bringing in container loads of this stuff. And, you know, a lot of the glass companies and the conventional commercial companies and the Home Depots and the Lowe's don't have acrylic in the kind of volumes and types that we're, we're able to get our hands on. Well, that's great. Congratulations on that business, Paul. Thanks. Okay, let me uh, move on to a second question. Um, Paula, I'll start with you on this one. And that is, if something like COVID happens again, what would you do differently the next time? Um, I hate to think that something like this could happen again. Um, and if it does, I hope I continue to have the intestinal fortitude I have to keep plowing ahead. But um, I would say, um, the safest thing for a business owner in this industry is to maintain a high SPE. Um, if you have a high sales per employee, then you can withstand better a uh, drop in sales. Um, and uh, that's one thing I would make sure that I continue to do. And as far as doing anything differently, I think I would turn off the 24 seven news cycle. Um, it was certainly stressful and didn't really help matters. Um, and I would, I would kind of turn that down quite a bit more than I did this time. I think I could have saved myself a lot of, uh, a lot of angst. All right, that's good advice, Paula, thank you. Dirk, uh, let me ask you that same question. Uh, you're, you're a little bit retired. You're a little bit outside the industry now, but from your observations, uh, should the print industry do something differently next time? Well, uh, yes and no. Um, oddly enough, in December of 2018, I did a uh, special report in our newsletters about being prepared for the unexpected, disaster preparedness mm -hmm. and recovery. And I was talking not only about natural disasters, but other things that happen. And um, uh, of course, uh, one of the things that caused me to do that was that FEMA, who handles natural disasters, said that 40%, 40% of small businesses are unlikely to reopen after a, a substantial natural disaster. And that, that got me concerned. And I'm now hearing statistics about, for example, the number of restaurants that might not reopen or other types of small businesses. So you do need a plan. Um, I do agree with Paula completely about not paying too much attention to the news because I can <laughs> work on your mental state. Um, but uh, I do also agree that you need really good financial reserves to get you through any kind, natural or pandemic kind of disaster. In other words, you need the resources within your company to keep going without cash flow coming in, at least for a short period of time. Uh, we can't, I, I have been impressed by the uh, resources that have been put forward, government programs and what have you, but not all of them came immediately. Um, and you, you have to have some reserves. High sales per employee is another one. Um, and then finally, um, while it is hard to prepare for this, because you don't know exactly what you're, I, I wasn't preparing for a pandemic, that's for sure. But the um, a business continuity plan, just a general continuity for any kind of disaster, really, really makes sense. And um, if anybody's interested, I'd be glad to send them a copy of that report because it's got a way, it's got a blueprint about how to do a continuity plan. But you can mm -hmm. find those on other places as well. Thank you, Dirk. Mm -hmm. Paul, how about you? Having been through this now, would you do something different if uh, something else like this happened again? I think the only thing I would do differently is uh, is I'd get an earlier start relative to what it was that, uh, you know, about a month and a half into this thing, I, I, I really kind of caught a revelation on. Uh, I, I do network actively. I'm in a couple of uh, different groups that, that, that we tactically network together. And you know, I've, I found that in, in uh, one of the groups, uh, which meets weekly, um, that about five weeks in, we, we were getting together and it was almost like, a, you know, a, it was almost like a wake. Um, and, and I realized that, you know, we're, this is a room full of 
service providers. We're a room full, full of problem solvers, and there've never been more problems than, than in you know, my lifetime that, than people are facing right now. So we kind of started with each other and how we could help each other uh, and then tactically aligned ourselves with, uh, with, with one another at, to a greater degree, really doubled down on the idea of working together to try to help each other through it. Uh, the, the other thing that I've done in regards to the PPE uh, thing, you know, with these screens is I'm, I'm getting together and working together with, I've sought out people who are selling the temperature devices, for instance, um, and, and some, uh, you know, sanitizer and, and masks and things like that, which we, we have, we've chosen not to, not, not to really focus on because, uh, you know, we, we've got enough facilities here that we have to continue to uh, produce stuff for, and it, you know, it, it would, yeah, maybe we could do well with it, but it'd be a distraction, and we're trying to stay uh, focused on the things that, uh, that, that are going to give us the biggest bang, and we, we felt like if we aligned ourselves with people that, uh, that we could strategically go in together or refer one another other for opportunities. Um, it, 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 even though I network, even though I actively network, I, I really kind of was a little bit caught up by maybe what Paul was talking about, the, uh, the distraction um, and, and, and the fear and the noise. Um, and, you know, we were, we were working, but I don't think we were working as smart as we could uh, by taking advantage of the connections uh, and the people that we knew who we could help and, and they could, I mean, that's really kind of why I'm here today. I mean, it's, it's not like I've got more time right now uh, to, to do something like, like, like this um, b because I don't have work to do. I, I, I'm working 75, 80 hours a week, which I didn't anticipate doing uh, at, at this stage of my career. Um, Ed talked about it before. I am now actually physically working in my seventh decade uh, and I'm still working, but, uh, but, but I, you know, it's, this is a challenge. Um, you know, Rocky Balboa said, it's not uh, how hard you can hit, but how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. And, and uh, so that, that, that's what I'm doing. But I realized about five weeks in that I needed to not, tr not do it so much by myself, but to, you know, to, to rely on and work together with partners and people uh, who are collectively motivated to work together and, and to help each other. That's great advice in any situation, I think. And I can echo that, uh, that feeling. Uh, I think the first few weeks in the association side, we, we thought, well, this is going to pass or, or what can we do? Mm -hmm. But very quickly, we realized how much uh, the association could be helping with uh, forums and webinars and news articles and things. And it's spun up and, and we've been busier than ever also, just keeping up with all those requirements. So. I think the next time we'll be one step ahead. Attendees, let me remind you that you can ask questions at any time. Don't hold back. If you have something you want to ask uh, of any of the panelists, please go ahead and, and fire it off and we will raise those questions later. Okay, uh, let me move on to another question. <clears throat> and uh, this, I'm going to start with you, Paul. Have you had a chance to think about the future of your firm post COVID? How will it look different than it is now? You know, you know, our, our company uh, as a service provider has got to be driven by what the, wh what it's going to look like for our clients. Um, and being out and around and talking to as many of the higher level people, the administrative uh, executives and the owners of companies, one of the things that we've, uh, it's, it's become clear to us because we've been, you know, we, we were a, uh, an essential business and we've worked every day through this and we've been out and seen, you know, the empty parking lots and the empty buildings. Uh, I've been in buildings actually in Manhattan that, that are, you know, like a million square foot buildings and there's, you know, single digit number of people in the building. And, and it's a little eerie, but what they're telling us is what percentage of the people are not coming back. It worries me from a commercial real estate standpoint, but uh, at the end of the day, it, it is, I, I think on the back end of this thing, going to be much more decentralized, many, many, many more people working from home. And to the degree and extent that print is necessary. And I think there, you know, there, there's already uh, suggestions out there that you shouldn't be exchanging print because you could have vir viral activity on the, uh, on the documents, which is, you know, we, we don't want to talk about here, but uh, it, you know, it's a reality. It's something they're talking about, but to the degree and extent that there are things that need to be filed or, or distributed um, and, and print is still a part of it. 
Um, I, I think there's going to be opportunities for us because wh why would a company who's only going to bring uh, a third or a quarter of the people back to an office have the same kind of centralized reproduction facilities? I think our opportunities are going to be web-based submission uh, applications uh, and, and, distri and more distribution of the documentation that they would typically um, be doing in their house or sending out to us in bulk. So it might be a shift in some cases, but in other cases, I think there would be opportunities for us. Um, you know, if we get ahead of that curve and go after clients and say, you know, just what I was talking about before, how can we help? You know, your, your problem is you're going to have a lot of real estate. You know, what about that print room? Uh, what is your plan with that? What, and, and how can we help? Mm -hmm. Paul, have you had any uh, opportunity to provide equipment to homebound engineers or architects who might suddenly have a need for a, uh, a printer? We have not yet. Um, so far, you know, because I think a lot of them are at the point where they still imagine that they might go back, uh, that, that we haven't turned that corner yet. I suspect that that's something that we, we, we may see. Uh, in fact, probably, we probably will see it. Uh, but at this point, it's been more, you know, just here's an easy way to submit and they're submitting and we're doing more of that work and doing more porch drops or doing more direct distribution. Uh, but I, I would suspect that that's coming. Uh, I would certainly suspect that that's coming. I think that a lot of the bigger machines are going to become smaller machines um, and, and are going to be uh, in, in more places. So um, that, that, that's a good point, Ed. Thank you, Paul. Paula, uh, how about you? Have you had a chance to think about the future of your, of your firm? Um, certainly, almost nonstop. And um, I would say that... Um, Having a, a set of, of core values is, is key. Things that don't change when everything else changes, something that your company relies on and knows that regardless of what's happening in the world, good or bad, these are the values that we have and, and this is what who we are and, and what we do. So that is not gonna change for a pandemic, a natural disaster or you know winning a billion dollar lottery those things would, would never change um, again back to the SPE I, I can't emphasize that enough how important it is to try to maintain that um, and um, I also believe that in the past Maybe we've been a little on the smug side as far as the, the clients that we work with. Um, and we, we do feel like we're the best in the area and maybe we have a little bit of a, a, an attitude about that. Um, and now it's brought more to the forefront that any job is important. Big customer, small customer, um, it's the work coming in that feeds the machine and provides the blood that your company needs to survive. So I think that, you know, we've all had a little bit of a taste of humble pie here and, and uh, I'd, be, I'd be willing to bet that, that my company is going to be um, a bit less smug, a little bit more humble in the future. And, uh, and hopefully that will serve us well. Thank you. Paula, you've mentioned uh, sales per employee a couple of times. How has this current situation affected your sales people's efforts? Uh, I assume they're not going knocking on doors at the moment. And do you think that things will return to normal or, or have they learned some new sales tricks or techniques that they may continue in the future? Um. Well, like everyone, we've we've tried to adapt to what our clients are looking for, and we've done more um, teleconferencing, I suppose, rather than the in-person meetings, which is sad because I think that those are important. It's hard to, you know, let someone feel a paper sample or look at a finish, you know, over a Zoom. So hopefully we'll get back to that at some point. I don't think it's going to be as quickly as we were all hoping or expecting, but 
think eventually it will get back to that. But we've done a lot more outbound digital marketing and social media, um, you know, direct mail. I mean, trying to to walk the the talk there. So um, we're we're still learning. It's it's still it's still early days, even though it seems like it's been forever. We're still we're still trying to learn things. Okay, thank you. Dirk, uh, let me ask that same question uh, from your perspective. How do you think the print industry will look post COVID? Uh, Ed, I, I think the print industry fundamentally will be, be similar, but a number of trends that have already started are, are going to uh, become even more, um, more significant. One is consolidation. I think there are, the, already a lot of interest. I saw that in my newsletter, just about every other issue. I had something about, uh, should I sell my accounts? Uh, what should I do about all this equipment? Uh, uh, so that's going to continue to, to occur. And I think not just the, the consolidation will be driven by uh, economies of scale and by changes in the marketplace. I think a second thing that Paul alluded to is uh, there is going to be more virtual office work, more people working remotely. That again is a trend that's already started, but I'm seeing it um, more and more. This has just forced everybody to give it a try, but um, it's like the old um, uh, ad, uh, try it, you'll like it, you know. Some people are sort of liking when they're working from, uh, uh, I think I was in New York area, a bread company or something, but uh, the uh, uh, more people are working from home and they like that. So uh, I, I think that um, the trends that have already started are, are going to continue and become, become accelerated even, uh, whether we like it or not. Unfortunately, before we had a little more control. Now the, the locomotive is beginning to run away a little bit and uh, we better be prepared for those business changes and getting back to the final thing would be Paula's uh, 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 mention of sales per employee, my mention earlier of, of a good balance sheet is gonna be important. Uh, and, and I think the survivors of this uh, uh, experience are going to have those, gonna have their numbers all in good order, hopefully. Right, I can I can back up the uh, the point that you made, Dirk, about uh, trends in in digitized work growing mm -hmm. uh, because of people working at home and because of uh, people's just general uh, desire not to have to meet each other. Uh, mm -hmm. I've talked to several repro firms that have uh, said if we're not doing uh, our digital side well, we need to really step it up. Uh, and that's that's worldwide too. I, I have some contact with the German Repro Group, and they uh, also have found that the the movement towards digital submissions for plans uh, on the municipality side uh, has just accelerated because nobody wants to have paper delivered. They want everything set up digitally. They were already moving that way, and this this really accelerated it. So, all right, all right, thank you. Uh, attendees, again, let me ask uh, if you have any questions, use your Q&A tab, please, and send them in. Uh, let me uh, ask another question here. I'm going to start with, with Paula on this one. Paula, overall, uh, not just at your company, but overall, how do you think the print industry will change in the coming 12 months? What opportunities should print companies be thinking about? Um, this. Uh this goes along with what Dirk just said about consolidation. I think that um, I think there's a lot of companies that are always kind of skating on the edge of profitability, and um, and at at this point they're probably thinking about selling or closing. So I think there's opportunities for those companies in acquisition mode to come in and and uh, and get some some good deals for companies that you know that might be closing. Um, I think it it could be a, a good time for you know a sensible tuck-in type of um, situation. 
think also that's going to cause the used equipment market to um, become more robust and, and drive prices down. So if, uh, if any company is interested in growing, this could be a, a good time to start considering what equipment you need and, and try to source that from closing companies. I also think that um, it's, it's just going to be a wildly swinging pendulum. I mean, you know, one end are companies that like restaurants that are closing and, and weaker, smaller businesses that are closing and, you know, event oriented businesses, you know, event planners, whatever, they might be closing. So on one end, there's a lot of bad news, but on the other end, there's, there's companies that are growing exponentially and it's a matter of determining those industries and approaching them to see how, how you can assist them and, and what services you can provide for them. So I think our, I think our roster of customers is going to be changing dramatically over the next 12 months. That's interesting. Thank you, Paul. Can you, can you think of some industries that you might be pursuing as new clients that maybe you weren't pursuing before COVID? Um, I mean, just off the top of my head, I would say that, you know, cybersecurity companies are going to be in, in big demand with more people working remotely. Um, I think chemical companies, um, I think security companies and cleaning companies, companies that do cleaning, bio, you know, biotech companies. Um, I think uh, I think all of those types of industries are are seeing a, a dramatic increase. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Paul. Let me ask that same question of you. Uh, overall, how do you think the reprographics industry is going to change in the coming year and what opportunities should companies in reaper graphics be thinking about you know it's kind of interesting because forgive me this is my cell phone ring um i'm not sure it's going to be just a year uh I, you know the thing that's concerning me is uh, so many of the people that i'm i'm talking to um they're not even considering um, and that's part of why I think this, uh, this acrylic thing is going to be sustained for a while, but they're not even thinking about returning to the office until March of next year, a lot of them. Um, so, I, you know, I, th I think there's going to be sort of a, uh, an extended, whatever that normalization is. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball and I'm not a hundred percent sure yet. I'm really still talking to my clients fairly regularly about, about this. And, you know, they're not even back at their offices, even to a small degree yet. I think they're still trying to feel it out. So, um, you know, I, I think for us, it's going to be one of listening uh, and, and looking for the opportunities. Uh, you know, I think it was a great list on Paula's part in regards to, uh, to people that we're going to be uh, uh, looking at and, and working at. The one, one of my acrylic lists that I forgot before was churches and uh, synagogues that a lot of the uh, places of, uh, of worship um, and faith, you know, that a lot of people are rallying around that, but it's all being done by Zoom and those folks are all gonna get back together. So I think there, there are just areas of opportunity where, it, you know, I think to be sustainable, um, we've got to expand the markets or the, the places where we actually do work with, uh, or we need to find a couple of, uh, a couple of verticals that we can, you know, really dig into and double down. I mean, in New Jersey here, uh, pharma has been big for a long time, um, but I think that's going to decentralize. A lot of people are going to be working from home in that field, and the, the a lot a lot of the training was done face to face. And I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. So, and I think it's it's going to be a, a protracted time of transition and change. And um, I, I I think it's a little bit early for me to sort of project, other than to just say that we really need to pay attention. Uh, get close to our clients, and uh, you know, Paul was talking about the, uh, the what the sales call looked like. Um, you know, I I think it, when we're we're talking to our clients, um, it, it's got to be you know, w w what are you hearing? What's going on? What are you guys planning? What are the things you need to know? Um, I, I just think it's early. Uh, I it's really that's a hard question to ask. It really is. 
Um, I, I think if we're going to survive, uh, it, we're, we're going to have to be paying attention uh, to the changes and, and the opportunities like Paula was just talking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. By the way, what, one quick thing for uh, Dirk, it was Alka-Seltzer. Uh, try it like it was Alka-Seltzer. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> and Dirk, let me, uh, let me direct that last question to you. What opportunities do you think uh, the print companies should be thinking about in the coming 12 months? What, what, how is the industry going to be different and what industries can they be tapping? Well, I, I agree with both Paul and Paula that I think, I think our customers are going to tell us that. In other words, staying yeah. close to your customers, seeing what their needs are. Uh, we're problem solvers. We're good problem solvers. And we can use the same skills. Uh, many years ago, I, I, I survived the transition. We were actually had a typesetting business and we started. And most of you will say, what is typesetting? <laughs> So we saw the advent of um, desktop publishing and do it yourself. And we transitioned into some other things like quick printing and copy shops and what have you, because our business was going away. We're in a little bit of the same situation now. Some parts of our business are probably going to go away. I can't tell you exactly what, but listening to our customers, working closely with them uh, will make a difference. I agree with Paula. I think there's going to be some equipment buying opportunities. I compare this to post 2008 financial meltdown. There's going to be a lot of equipment back with the manufacturers. It's going to depress prices. So if you're in the market, this is the time to look. Um, I have been a, a, a alone in the wilderness on this, but maybe there's some opportunities in 3D printing. Yes, I know it's not printing. Uh, it's actually additive manufacturing, but um, I, I followed it pretty closely. And it has, even though it, the product is, is, is a physical, physical thing, uh, uh, the skills required are similar to what we do in the print business. And something to keep in the back of your mind, even though, again, uh, it's not really printing. I'm glad it was called printing. It helps some people come to us for it, even though it's, uh, so, so that's a marketing uh, plus right there. Um, another example, which sort of corresponds with what Paul said, was um, a WS Display, which is a fairly big company, is now offering uh, portable cubicles. I mean, they're basically uh, build it yourself. And they've taken your technology, which was ba based on um, trade show displays, and they've repurposed it into uh, protective panels, pop up panels, you know, cubicles, temporary distancing. Uh, systems. So there are a lot of different directions we, we're going to be able to go, and I think our customers are going to tell us uh, uh, what those directions are. All right, thank you. Okay, attendees, let me remind you to ask questions. Uh, we have about uh, 15 minutes left on our presentation. Uh, I've got a couple questions that are here. Um, this one is directed to Paul Corman. Paul, uh, what was the learning curve on the making the sneeze guards? Was it difficult to, to learn and was it something that you were doing before the crisis? You know, it was not something we were doing, but you know, with, with the, uh, the, the router technology, you know, we, we were cutting dimensionally uh, already. So um, you know, it, it was actually in some regards simpler to some of the things that we did when we're doing like special silhouette cuts and uh, and what have you, uh, you know, more more of this is you know straight rectangular. Uh, the learning curve was more kind of the going out and measuring. I actually did try at one point to um, see if we could um, find a, an out of work carpenter or, or builder who somebody who could go out and and really had the experience to uh, measure up a job because it's construction uh, in some cases. Um, and, and so, uh, I, I was not successful in doing that. Uh, what we did is, uh, one of the things that we did is we, we would go out and estimate jobs and then, uh, order the materials and send them out there and find out that we were a little bit off. Uh, now what we do is we estimate jobs. Uh, and then when we go to build them, we go out and measure again and the, and the, uh, installation team. Uh, goes out and, and might tweak the project. So that was the, uh, you know, the, the 
trying to, to get, a, get to a position where you get it right the first time, especially because a number of these opportunities have become multiple locations or have turned into referrals. We've gotten a lot of referral business because of this. And uh, we actually established, uh, we, we bought a URL. It goes to one of our pages on our site, but we've got the uh, logo on it and it's uh, blockthatsneeze.com. Um, but we did it for the purposes of, you know, it was easier than our company name and it related to what it was that we we're doing. Um, and uh, we've gotten a lot of referrals, but you want to do the job right um, the first time. Uh, so, you know, at part of our learning curve was, was, you know, not winging it or, you know, trying to get close or, or thinking you got it right the first time. Uh, we haven't misestimated anything, which, you know, is always a concern. But what we have done is uh, estimated it where, you know, the, then when we went out there, the, the conditions uh, maybe were a little bit more complicated than they, they, they appeared at the, at the time. So we're, we're letting, the, uh, uh, letting the mechanical people go out there um, before we do a, a, a complex install. If it's a shield that's just going on a counter, it just goes. Uh, but uh, it, it, the learning curve wasn't bad because of some of the things that we're doing already. I think if you're starting from scratch, I mean, one of these things used is going to be an $80,000 cutter. Um, it's not the kind of thing that I, I would try to do with a, with a saw and a razor blade. All right. Thank you. Uh, here's a question uh, directed to Paula. Paula, uh, you mentioned acquisitions. What are people looking for when they are acquiring some basics and is this time a good time to be acquiring considering the difficult business conditions? Uh, great question. Um, my, uh, my management team kind of posed that same question to me at, at um, one of our meetings recently. And they're like, maybe we should be, you know, in a position to talk to some of our competitors, see how they're doing. And, um, and possibly talk about buying them out. And um, for me, that wasn't palatable. I, um, I'm, not, I'm not mentally in a position where I would like to deal with an acquisition right now, but a lot of, a lot of places would be well served to do so. And, and I mean, Dirk's probably a better person to talk to about this than me, but I know that there's you know, there's a lot of different ways to, to, to do them, depending on what it is. I mean, um, asset purchase, tuck in, um, you know, things like that, or, or just kind of have a buyout of the, of the accounts and, uh, and pay us, you know, pay a flat fee and then um, a certain percentage over a, a certain number of years. Um, that's how, you know, a lot of the uh, successful acquisitions are, are um, laid out. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Paul. Okay, that's the end of the questions that we have. Uh, unless attendees, if you have anything else, send it in the last minute here. Oh, here's one just came in. <clears throat> um, why don't we direct this uh, to Paula first and then to Paul. Can, can you provide a range of sales per employee that you try to achieve? Um, I belong to the National Print Owners Association, NPOA, um, and I believe that the average in the industry um, for the, the Quick printing industry is about 129, 130 per employee. Um, we try to maintain an average of 50% higher than that, which puts us in the, the top quartile. Um, but I believe that average is about 130, and if you're below that, then um, like John Stewart used to say, when you get to the office, just fire the first person you see. And uh, and help get your numbers uh, back where they need to be. All right, Paul. How about you? Do you have a, a feeling on sales per employee? So I'm more on the operations and sales side, and uh, so that's that's really my brother's department in the business. But uh, you know, I I think uh, at least historically um, that our numbers are pretty close to where Paula 
is that uh, <clears throat> that that we've uh, we, we've been pretty significantly north of that uh, 130 number, um, and that's just looking at a seat of the pants. Now through this, um, and while the government was paying our people uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, you know we we've been obviously fighting our way through um, this and using our resources to try to build uh, opportunities in business. Like I said, I took four of my staff and went to pure research and promotion uh, with, with internal sales. And then I had to shift a couple of people into the installations where there was business. Um, it's been lower than that. Um, and it's something now coming out of this that uh, we're going to have to keep a really close eye on. Um, we did not bring everybody back after the PPP. Um, simply because we knew we weren't going to have uh, enough work. We had a night shift, which we ended up uh, closing all together because there simply wasn't enough work. Um, but, uh, you know, I think Paula's numbers are, uh, are uh, healthy numbers. We, we, we try to stay uh, signif significantly north of that, uh, that 130 number. But where we are exactly right now uh, is um, that, that, that's a cubicle um, just north of me here. All right. Thank you. Paul, let me follow up uh, quickly on that. And when the crisis hit, how did your chain, your, your sales efforts change when you were trying to reach especially uh, new potential clients? Obviously, you weren't going door to door selling. Uh, no, uh, you know, what, one of the things that uh, that that we did is, uh, well, first off, nobody was around. I mean, at the, at the initially, what, before we got the PPP, we, we dropped out. I only had five five people on staff at that point. That was about twenty percent of my normal staff, and and we were just handling the stuff that was coming in and out, and and it, and it wasn't much. I, you know, we were we were probably off seventy to seventy five percent the first full month, and uh, once uh, once we uh, we we brought people back, um, you know, th then we we pretty much got to the point where uh, um, our, our efforts um, started uh, with, with um, a combination of uh, email and, uh, and, and a lot of social promotion. Um, and one of the things we had going for us at the time uh, was we do a lot of signage and uh, with, on the direct print machine. Uh, and a good month for us on the lawn signs is about 1,500 signs a month. Uh, well, because of what was going on this year, um, we, we were doing 1,500 signs every two days uh, for, the, for the course of about two months. That created um, a, a combination of some activity to, to kind of carry us, but also we were upselling or reselling or, or, or uh, getting referrals or looking for referrals from all of the people that were coming in for all these things. Um, and I've actually got an installation that we're finishing up for uh, uh, three acrylic gra graphics and 600 office graphics uh, from an agency, a uh, huge agency of 1,200 people, uh, the, although they'll probably only bring 300 back to the office. Um, and that was as a result of somebody buying a single lawn sign wow. and, seeing our, and seeing our acrylic shield. So, um, you, you know, there, there was a, w in the context that we've had, you know, we've done whatever we could to, to try to come up with creative solutions uh, with the people that we are working with. We're actually just getting to the point where we're starting to call people because people are available. If you don't have cell phone numbers, that's, that's something for the future. If I had it to do over again, I would get more people's cell phone numbers be, because, uh, you know, that, that's been part of the challenge. People working from home, uh, not all of them are, are, uh, are connected by their work phone. A lot of people are working with their cell phones. So that's been a challenge. Good point. Paul, there was a, a quick follow-up on that uh, the sales per employee question, and it was, uh, I assume these are annual numbers. That's, that's right, yes. right. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here's another question that just came in. Uh, and Paula, I'm going to direct this to you. Uh, just so that you know, Paula, all of the attendees are members of the association, which means they're all, most of their business is large format printing. Okay. Uh, yes. So this person asked, we've had our biggest downturn in business with small format, which to you, Paulo, is regular, you know, regular mm -hmm. printing. Yeah. And she says, uh, this questioner asks, any thoughts about different opportunities for that segment? If anyone has any, I am willing to hear them. I mean, it's, it's definitely been suffering in our area, too. I mean, we're, we're doing a, a lot more wide format. We call it wide format, large format. Um, 
than we've ever done. Um, it's a larger share of our business, but um, there's just not a whole lot of, um, of activity in the, what you're calling the small format. I mean, if you can do mailers or any type of, um, like for nonprofits, uh, appeal mailers, I mean, those things are, you know, are still, we're still printing that. Um, but uh, I mean, there's just, there is just not a lot of small format work right now. Mm -hmm. Dirk, can you answer that question? Any, any ideas for this uh, attendee and where there might be some more work in that regard? Um, yeah, small, small format or, or uh, publication work, uh, that sort of thing has really been hit hard, I think. Um, uh, I think I mentioned earlier the course packs, you know, for students. Uh, I suppose universities too will probably be doing that, at least some of them this fall, especially if they go off line. Every, some of it still needs to be done uh, with hard copy. Uh, the good old law firms uh, still are very paper bound and paper based. Uh, a good part of my business, uh, since that's my educational background, is uh, you know, in the law. Uh, we did a lot of litigation support. I suspect some of that is still going to be out there, especially evidentiary work where uh, paper records are being copied. That's going to continue. Uh, or scanned. Uh, in fact, I just had a call from uh, state government the other day asking about scanning uh, small format documents. So if you've got some scanners around or you want to buy some cheap, um, that is still a viable option. And you can use your people to do that. So, uh, but no, I, I haven't heard a whole lot about big op new opportunities. I mean, it, it's basically going out and trying to sell <laughs> what you've been doing. Um, you know, harder and hoping that uh, things will come back more quickly. Uh, but I, I don't have the magic bullet there. Thank you. Dave. So can I, can I address that? Because I, I haven't talked about it all, but, but, but I, we do do a lot of uh, small format uh, in color and black and white. That's always been a huge part of our business here. We, uh, uh, I'll chime in on the litigation side. We do a lot of litigation support, a lot of family law activity right now. And a lot of it's still in paper, although a lot of it's in scanning as well as well as that they're giving us files to functionally what we call, you know, from barring the, the microfilm term, blow back to copy. So there is a lot of paper that's still going on. There's a lot of submission uh, stuff, although a lot of that stuff is being electronically submitted, but sometimes you have to convert it to paper. The other thing we've taken advantage of is uh, because we do scan, uh, we, we've actually uh, offered to some of our clientele to take some of their back files, some of their old stuff and provide scanning uh, at a reduced rate, as long as they don't care how how long it takes to do it. If they want to convert their old stuff, uh, we bring boxes in here, and then we just take stuff off the pile uh, and, and scan. And you know, instead of playing cards when there's nothing to do, uh, we have people prepping documents and scanning. Uh, the other thing is that to to speak to the course packs idea in a corporate setting is we've had some clients who've actually now done training but they're doing the training virtually but they they have found the same thing they found in the schools that that it seems to go better uh when these folks have workbooks in front of them they have the, you know whatever the notes are so we've done uh, for a couple of large companies we've done regular print and distribution but now we're distributing to the 150 people who are going to be doing the studies at home so instead of shipping it all to a hotel or, or, to, or delivering it back to the headquarters, uh, we're actually sending out 150 FedExes uh, to, to residences for people. Uh, so this is something I, I would suggest, you know, when you, if you're talking to people who've done training in the past, find out how they're going to be doing training in the future uh, and even use that as sort of a case study to say, you know, some of our clients have found that in education and public education, or private education that the, they found that the training goes better with documentation in front of them. And so what some people are doing, this is the, our side of the, what are you hearing out there that you could share with people to put that idea in somebody's head. Great, thank you, great ideas. Let me uh, touch on something that Paul mentioned too on the lawn signs. I interviewed one of our members uh, a few weeks ago who created a lawn sign for some high school graduates and I think he actually donated the signs the first few but of course he had his company's name and contact at the bottom of the lawn sign 
And immediately all sorts of other graduates, even from other schools, noticed those signs and started placing orders. Uh, so the, the lawn sign thing, even though maybe it hasn't been a traditionally a, a marketing thing, uh, has turned into that for some people. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we are out of time, but uh, let me uh, thank Dirk and Paula and Paul. Your contributions today were wonderful, and I'm sure that the attendees enjoyed what you had to say and learned some things from it. And attendees, thank you very much for coming today. This uh, event was recorded, and it will be posted on the APDSB members uh, portal uh, later today or tomorrow. And uh, we'll announce that uh, in tomorrow's newsletter. So thank you again. Appreciate your time. And uh, please uh, continue attending APDSP events. And that ends today's webinar. Thanks, Ed.